Hey, so as you can see by the title of the video, I'm going to be talking about safe binding. It's worth noting that binding is never 100% safe. You need to do things to make sure that you're as safe as possible, because you don't want anybody getting hurt. So I'm going to be talking about what chest binders you can get, how you can get them, do's, don'ts, a little bit about binding while swimming, and also some alternatives for people who might not be able to get hold of a binder or ways that they might be able to. So first of all, the best and safest way to bind is with a binder purposely made for chest binding. Examples of a couple of companies who make chest binders specifically for binding the chest are GC2B and Underworks. They're like the most highly recommended ones by like most trans guys, so I will leave the links to their websites in the description below so you can go and check them out. And if you are looking for a binder, you know that those are the most like sort of credible companies. But even with these binders, there are things that you need to do to make sure you are as safe as possible. So the first thing is try to wear it for as little time as possible and never wear it for over 8 hours. 8 hours is like the maximum cap off point. And obviously that 8 hours will be when you're out and about and around sort of people you don't know and the sort of time that you'll be most dysphoric. And obviously never ever sleep in the binder. One, because as I've said, you're only supposed to bind for 8 hours. And also while you're asleep, your muscles relax so it can damage your muscles and your ribs and restrict your breathing as well. And if you don't wake up, you're not going to be aware that this is happening. It can do damage without you even knowing that it's causing damage. And with that, take as many binder free days as possible. If you're not going out or you're only going out for like an hour or two, don't bind while you're at home and just bind while you're out. If you've got a day where you're not going anywhere, you just could be at home or at family somewhere that obviously you're comfortable, don't bind while you're there. I always try to take as many binder free days as possible. In fact, it's just come to the end of the uh, two week Easter break. And I think I've probably taken like five or six binder free days out of those two weeks because I've just been at home not really doing anything. And when I have been binding, most of the days I've just been kind of out for a few hours to do like work stuff or go and see your family. So then I've not been binding for long at all while I have been. So it's always good to let your chest breathe and get a break and it's always good to just not depend on it. You don't want to be wearing it every single day if you're not going anywhere. One thing to note is that some people think you can't exercise at all while you're binding. But you can exercise with a binder on it, you just can't do heavy exercise. So if you're only doing a few little bits and taking regular breaks and not getting really out of breath and really, really like exercising really hard, then that's absolutely fine. But doing like really heavy exercise like cardio and stuff like that for long periods of time is not okay to be doing while you're binding because again, you know, we do an exercise anyway, so it's gonna affect your breathing and it's kinda stretching your chest, which is not gonna help the breathing. So yeah, if you're exercising with your binder on, only do light exercise and take regular breaks between. If you've been wearing it for a while and it's starting to hurt, take it off as soon as possible. So like if you're at school and it's coming towards the end of the day and you're about to leave, as soon as you get home, get changed, take the binder off, put some pajamas, a baggy hoodie or something like that on. Because again, you don't want to be binding for longer than necessary and if it's hurting, you want to get it off as soon as possible. I've also heard a lot of people say that they actually take breaks, like if they're at college or somewhere and it's starting to hurt a little bit, they'll like go to the toilet in a cubicle or if it's like a separate toilet on its own, just go in there and take it off and just sort of stay with it off for like 10-15 minutes, just give yourself that bit of a break. And if you're sweating a lot or the binder's sort of chafing, you can use baby powder to absorb the moisture and sort of stop it from rubbing as much. Which might also be a good idea for if you're exercising. If you can get a binder but you're worried about getting it sent home because it's not a safe place or your parents aren't supportive and you're scared of them finding it, it would be a good idea to either get it sent to a friend's house or another supportive family member's house. Or even if you're part of an LGBT group or some sort of safe space, you may be able to get it sent there. Now, if you are looking into buying a binder, then make sure you get the right size. Check the measurement chart. You can also ask for size and assistance. I know that GC2B definitely do that. You can email them. They'll tell you what measurements you need to do. They'll also give you a visual chart to show you where you need to measure. And then you send them your measurements and they will tell you which size will be best for you. A good idea is always to measure several times to make sure that the measurements are as accurate as possible. And never go a smaller size than what you're meant to get. If you're sort of between sizes, like for example, some size charts are a bit stupid that they do this, but some will say like, 32 to 36 inches and that'll be like a size small and then the size medium will be 36 to like 40 inches so if you're 36 inches you're like do i get a medium or a small and some people go for the small because they think oh it'll bind better because it'll be tighter that's not a good idea always go for the one that's bigger because that'll only bind up to 36 inches whereas the other one will bind better for 36 inches it's always good to be as safe as possible because you might think because your measurement's in that range that it won't matter and actually be because it's smaller it will sort of bind better but it's more likely to do more harm than good. And if you are just starting out binding or you're sort of thinking that it's not as flat as you'd like it to be, just keep in mind that you won't be like washboard flat because nobody is. Have a look at cis guys and see what their chest looks like. It's never going to be like straight flat down. Everybody sort of has this like little thing that goes out because that's just the way that our bodies are built. Also, again, cis guys' chests aren't completely flat. They have sort of this like, I don't know if to describe it, like shape. So you can sort of see that they have like the muscles basically. 
and especially look at guys that are a similar build to you so like i'm a little bit chubby so i would look at guys that have a sort of similar body shape to me see what their chest look like because binders aren't made to make you completely flat because again that's not a natural shape that's not anything that anybody looks like so they'll just give the impression of a male chest which like this is not completely flat it's got like a little bit of like bump to it and it's got like sort of the more shape of a masculine chest also, I will tell you about some of the possible things that can happen if you don't bind safely or if you get a bind that's too small. Because it's not meant to scare you, it's about making you aware of if you make the decision to get a bind that's too small for you and think, oh, it'll be fine, it won't be that bad. These are things that can happen and do happen. And I've heard stories from people saying, you know, trying to promote safe binding to people because they have been through these things and it's not a nice experience. So I've got a list of a few things that I wrote down. So it will restrict your breathing, obviously, because it's tight against your chest. Like I said, with the sleep thing, you can get weakened muscles. If you're binding constantly, especially in your sleep, your muscles are sort of using the binder as like a support system and your body gets used to it being there. So your muscles aren't really doing what they're supposed to do to like hold yourself up because the binder's doing that. You can get lung infections, again, because of the breathing that being around your chest is too tight. You can really mess up sort of your chest area. Again, other things to do with lungs like pneumonia, bronchitis, you can get rib deformations, again, because it's got they're constantly pushing against you. Your body just kind of grows and moves and moulds to where the binder's got it. Your ribs will become more fragile. You can get bruising, cracks, you can even break them. Think about if you break a rib and it goes in, it can puncture your lung. So people do get lung punctures if they're binding really unsafely. And just generally with any of those things or just binding unsafely, as soon as you start doing it, you will be in a lot of pain and it's not a nice thing to go through. It's not worth all those risks to get like as flat as possible. Again, remember what I said about the fact that you're not going to be completely flat. That's not the aim of it. The aim is just to not have as big of a female looking chest. So just bear those things in mind if you are binding and make sure you're as safe as possible because again, it's not worth the risks. Right, so a little bit on to binding while swimming. So you shouldn't wear a normal binder that you wear day to day for swimming. Because one, it's exercise, so if you're going to be swimming a lot, that's heavy exercise. Also, when you're in the water, your binder will obviously get saturated with water, get heavy. It can also shrink a little bit, so it can sort of tighten on your chest. But one thing that you can do is they actually make binders specifically for swimming. So they're designed to be sort of waterproof, they won't get heavy, they won't shrink. Obviously, keep in mind, with any binder, you shouldn't be doing heavy exercise, so make sure you take lots of breaks between if you're doing laps and stuff like that. If breathing gets difficult, definitely take a break, maybe go out for a little bit, take the binder off. Just be aware of your body and make sure you're not pushing yourself too hard. Or, alternatively, if you can't get hold of a swimming binder, there are a couple of things that you might be able to do. So something that somebody suggested to me that they used and they found that it worked quite well was wearing a sort of one-piece swimming costume. So basically, like the female swimming costumes, it's just kind of straps and then, like, short around the legs. And with the material of that, that'll sort of push your chest down a little bit and make it a bit flatter. Also wear a rash guard or a swimming top over the top. The sort of stretchy material that will also bind a little bit as well. And swimming trunks over the top. So you won't actually be able to see the costume underneath. It'll just help to bind a little bit. Or what a lot of people have said and do do is wearing a sports bra underneath a swim shirt. Again, the sports bra will flatten a little bit and the swim shirt on top will also flatten a little bit. And it just makes it a lot less obvious. And with these things, it's not likely to flatten completely like as much as a normal binder would day to day. But it will do enough to alleviate dysphoria while you're swimming. And safety should always come first. So if you haven't got a binder and you can't get a binder or you're not sure how to, I'm going to give you some ideas for things that you definitely should not do and not bind that way. And some things that you can do. And again, it's not going to be as safe as binding with a purpose-made binder because that's made to be as safe as possible. But it is a safer option to any of these things that I'm telling you not to do because they're really not safe. So to bind, you should never use bandages of any kind, especially ace bandages or any sort of tape. The reason you shouldn't use bandages is because they're not sort of stretchy material. They're made to like hold on to something. Binders obviously have stretching them for movement and things like that. Bandages don't do that. And the reason I say not to use ace bandages especially is because they're made for sort of compression and they're sort of designed to get tighter. So they're normally used for things like swelling. So say if your foot is swelled up, it pushes down on it. If it starts to swell again, it will constrict more to bring down the swelling. So obviously if you think about your breathing, this is going to be on your chest. When you inhale, your chest is going to expand, and then when you inhale, it's going to get smaller. And when it gets smaller, the ace bandages are then going to compress tighter because it works as if it's swelling, even though it's not as you're breathing. So the longer you're wearing them, the more you're breathing, the more they're going to constrict and get tighter and tighter. That's essentially like putting on a binder that fits well during the day. You wear it for eight hours, and by the end of it, it's extremely small and it's damaging, and it can do worse than a smaller binder. And then tape, obviously don't use it because, again, it doesn't have movement. It's meant to stick and stay there. 
Also, the glue stuff that's on tape can irritate your skin really bad, it can peel the skin off, it can give you sort of sores and lesions and stuff like that, and it's not nice at all. Some of the tape can be really, really hard to remove, so you can have it on for days at a time while it's irritating and be really hard to get off and painful to get off. And this is why I say to use things that are made for your chest, because these things weren't made to be able to bind your chest with. So they're obviously not going to be safe because they weren't made for that. So please, if you do anything, just please don't use those because they are like the most dangerous ways to bind ever and are not recommended by anyone at all. If anyone ever suggests that to you and say that it works for them, please don't take their advice. Make sure that you're being safe. Just because they're stupid enough to do something that's going to harm the body doesn't mean that you should follow. It's like your mum always says, if someone told you to jump off a bridge, would you do it? No. Well, I hope not. Don't jump off a bridge. And then lastly, if you can't get hold of a binder or you don't know how to, some ways that you can bind in the meantime and some ways that you might be able to get yourself an actual purpose-made binder. So first of all, if you can't get hold of a binder, some people use sports bras, some people use one. The most I would ever say to use is some people use two and they wear one forward and one backwards. Definitely won't go any more than that because it will start to constrict and it's just going to do the same as all the other things that I said and restrict your breathing it's not going to be good. So like if you don't have family support, at least if you ask them to buy you sports bras, they're going to think of it as it's just a bra. It's not anything for anything else. If you ask them for a binder, it might be a different reaction, but it can do something to sort of alleviate for you until you can get hold of a binder. Also, some people say to use one sports bra underneath a compression shirt. So it's basically just a tighter shirt. So sort of the exercise shirt's like a spandex sort of, like I think, like a spandex material. That's sort of tight, but it's obviously not really, really tight. But will make your chest a lot less obvious. Also, what a lot of people do is sort of layer up so you could wear like a sports bra and then like a tighter vest and a t-shirt over the top so you've got a few layers to help sort of compress a little bit. Definitely would not recommend doing that in summer because obviously it's warm out, you're going to get warm, you're going to get sweaty. Having several layers on is going to be a lot hotter than you if you were in one layer. And also with any binding in the summer, make sure that you stay hydrated, drink lots, make sure you go in the shade plenty so that you don't get overheated because again that can lead to sort of passing out and stuff and it's not very safe. Also something that works quite well and that I do both when I'm not wearing a binder on a day and I'm just sort of going outside to let the dog out or go into the outbuilding and get something is to wear baggy clothes. I actually did this before I came out and when I first came out before I got my first binder and I have a big chest like it's shrunken a lot now but when I first came out it was like a double D cup size. I wore a uh, bra and then I wore like baggy sort of shirts and hoodies and stuff over the top and it made it a lot less obvious because I was quite big, I've lost a lot of weight since then, it didn't look like my chest was massive compared to my size. I just kind of looked like I was chubby and I had man boobs. So I did pass from time to time, I didn't pass as well as I do now, but it did help dysphoria, it made it a lot less obvious, it made me feel better about myself. And I'm not sure how well this works, I haven't tried it myself, and I've not really tested the theory, but some people say that if you wear like shirts and baggy things with like loads of different patterns on it, it can sort of distract away from the chest. And I've heard this used with like women that are sort of bigger, if you wear like patterns and stuff it distracts from the shape of you and it just kind of brings the attention to what you're wearing and not your body shape so it seems like a credible idea and it's worth a go if it works for you then you know try it out and lastly just a couple of quick things on how you may be able to get yourself a binder so first of all there's plenty of binder giveaways around everywhere all over youtube i myself do a gc2b giveaway every single month also a lot of other people do that as well you can also find giveaways on instagram twitter Tumblr, Facebook, pretty much any social media, if you look for it, you'll probably be able to find a giveaway. So you can enter a few of those giveaways. Obviously, if you happen to be like really, really lucky and win two, like tell them that you've already got one, accept one of them and let somebody else win the other one. You don't need two binders and you know, help somebody else out while you help yourself out. But yeah, that's not guaranteed, but it's a chance. There's no point in not entering because it's like, oh, it's not guaranteed. But if you don't enter it, you don't have a chance at all. And a way that you can guarantee yourself a binder for very little money, it's normally just postage costs, is binder schemes. So the only one that I really know a lot about is one in England, which is called Morph, and it's based in Manchester. Now, saying that, that doesn't mean that you can't get one if you live in Australia, America, anywhere else, because they do ship worldwide. So basically, they're a not-for-profit. They basically just run off of donations. So people donate the binders to them, they have a catalogue, I think you email them, they send you the catalogue, you choose which binder you would like in the size that you would need, and then you pay them the amount of postage. So I know in the UK it's £3, I think in the US it's like £4, £5, and like anywhere else in sort of different regions it'll specify is about £7. So if you're in the UK it only costs you £3, and then anywhere else it costs cost up to £7, but that's a lot less than buying a binder brand new. And if you don't have much money, it's an opportunity for you to definitely guarantee yourself one. And depending on where you live, there'll probably be binder schemes 
closer to you and sort of more central that might cost a little bit less for shipping and things like that there might be ones that are completely free not entirely sure this is just one that i definitely know about so yeah there are ways that you can bind if you don't have a binder and in the meantime have a look at some binder schemes you can find some and also enter some giveaways because there's a chance of you winning all right so that's pretty much all i have to say i tried to cover as much as possible i think i covered a fair amount of stuff so hopefully it helped and if you did enjoy the video or it did help at all, please give it a thumbs up. You can also subscribe down below to see more from me. I post a video every single Sunday. Also, if you want to, you can follow me on my social media, which will be on the screen now. And if you ever need anybody to talk to, either just to vent or to get some advice, you can always message me on any of my social. I always try my best to answer as soon as possible. Obviously, depending on time zones and differences, replies might be a little bit late if I'm asleep or something like that. But I'll always get back to you and do my best to give you advice. And yeah, I really hope that this video was useful and that you do take in mind all these things and make sure you are as safe as possible. Because again, the risks involved aren't worth it. Just be safe. Make sure your body's healthy. And yeah, so thank you for watching. Come on the journey and hopefully I'll see you in this video.